Hey, Cloudcast listeners, before we get started, I want to introduce today's show sponsor, Liquid Technology. Is your company planning on migrating to the cloud, upgrading infrastructure, or relocating your IT hardware? Liquid Technologies Cloud Last is a suite of services that helps organizations move into the cloud. The Cloud Last team will de rack, pack, and purchase your excess technology hardware. So, why not increase your budget by getting money back for your excess IT equipment? In addition, Liquid Technology will ensure that your company's data is safe. They provide on or off site auditable data destruction services. So, whether your operations are in Ashburn or Amsterdam or somewhere in between, Liquid Technology has expert knowledge in local regulations to deliver a compliant international solution to your company. Liquid Technology is an EPA recognized dual certified green recycler. So, Visit cloudlast.co slash cloudcast today, sign up for the service, and you win a Cloudlast t-shirt. And one lucky winner will receive a $100 Amazon gift card. That's cloudlast.co slash cloudcast. And now, on to the show. Cloudcast Media presents, from the massive studios in Raleigh, North Carolina, this is the Cloudcast with Aaron Delb and Brian Gracely, bringing you the best of cloud computing from around the world. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome back to the Cloudcast. We are coming to you live from the massive Cloudcast studios here in Raleigh, North Carolina. The weather's starting to turn. It's starting to get a little bit warmer, which is nice. Uh, means the pollen's out as well, which is not as good, but it's good to have everybody back this week. You know, before we get started, uh, before we get into our interview and uh, what's going to be a really interesting show today, I wanted to talk a little about the Cloud News of the Week. Um, it's been an interesting week in terms of both new announcements and uh, and also some interesting large investments around a, a space that I think we're going to see more and more. So a couple of things. Um, first, in the acquisition space, uh, New Relic acquired Signif AI. So a uh, company in the AI space to bring AI to IT operations. So uh, New Relic expanding out their footprint from applications, getting into more the operation space and trying to bring some AI intelligence around those operations. Uh, we saw DigitalOcean, who is always been focused on really simplicity around public cloud offerings. They've, while they don't have nearly as many uh, offerings as some of the really large cloud providers, they've always focused on trying to make it as simple as possible, uh, make it simple for developers. They announced their database as a service offering. So SQL databases, uh, you know, managed uh, Postgres database service uh, just released. And I know uh, I've seen some, some early feedback from people like Mitchell Hashimoto, who runs HashiCorp, has uh, said he was really impressed with the, the initial service, how easy it was to get uh, connection pools up and running. So DigitalOcean continuing to expand their set of offerings, and again, continuing to focus on simplicity of service and really trying to delight developers. Um, and the last two are really two really big investments around the space of, of driverless vehicles and, and the evolution of, of like electronic vehicles and so forth. So uh, the first one is Driverless startup Neuro, N-U-R-O, is, gets a $940 million investment from SoftBank. So, uh, you know, driverless delivery startup. So again, as more and more people are using delivery services and, and uh, autonomous vehicles are becoming more and more viable, um, you know, people are beginning to make, you know, not just investments in the space, but really massive investments in the space as uh, behavior shift. And then finally, um, Amazon led a $700 million investment in the uh, electric Electric truck startup Rivian. So, um, you know, really trying to rival what Tesla is doing. Um, you know, Tesla being very much focused on uh, on more passenger style vehicles and SUVs. And this is really around uh, trucks and, um, you know, larger vehicles and so forth, where the battery demands are a little more, uh, a little more complicated. So interesting to see those, you know, almost $1.6, $1.7 billion investments around both driverless and uh, electronic vehicles. So we continue to see things on the edge and AI and so forth become really big parts of uh, what's going on in the cloud and really what's reshaping business. So with that, we're going to wrap up cloud news of the week. We want to really thank our sponsor, Datadog. Um, Datadog wants you to know as we've been talking about uh, with Datadog for a long time, they're not just a monitoring company, but they're really great at monitoring all of your AWS environments. So Datadog provides dashboarding, alerting, application performance monitoring, and log management all in one tight, tightly integrated platform so you can get end-to-end -end visibility of all of your AWS services from EC2, RDS, ECS, and any other AWS service that you're looking to run Datadog can help you monitor that, uh, make sure that, you know, your applications are running great, you've got visibility in what's going on there. So if you want to visualize key metrics, set alerts, uh, and really collaborate with your team to troubleshoot and fix issues, Datadog's a great platform for anything that you're doing around AWS. And if you want to try it out, you can go out, start a 14-day trial, um, 
you know, listeners of the show will, as always, receive a great Datadog t-shirt. But if you go to datadog.com slash cloudcast, sign up, get your 14-day trial, uh, and get your great Datadog t-shirt. So as always, we want to thank Datadog for sponsoring the show, for being a sponsor of the Cloud News of the Week. And with that, we're going to get to the show. And we're back. And, you know, one of the things that we've seen uh, just in starting the year was, uh, you know, thank you to everybody who's been listening. The show listens on the show have been up quite a bit, 30, 35 percent, which has been sort of surprising. I think people have been very interested in kind of the the breadth of topics we've been talking about so far. And, and obviously, we we kind of laid out some things that were going on. And and one of the things that we really didn't touch on in all those technology topics was was the people side of it. And And obviously, the people side of things, you know, what people are doing, what the cultures are is as important as, as anything. And so, you know, we thought between Aaron and I and our guest, Keith Townsend from CTO Advisor, you know, all of us have probably had almost every job except maybe software developer around IT. And so we thought it would be great to kind of do a roundtable between the three of us and, and talk about about kind of jobs, mid-career jobs, mid-career changes. And, and so, Keith, welcome back to the show, man. Great to have you back. It, it, it's been too long, guys. Thanks a lot. I know you've invited me in the past. I just, you know, I've been busy up to this point. So thanks for having me back. Yeah. And this is, a, and, and by the way, Keith, this is a nice way of saying we're all old when Brian <laughs> says between the three of us, we have a lot of experience. Yeah, I, I don't think we want to add up. You know, they, they say, oh, we have 100 years. I don't think we want to do that math. That's right. Like, we, we'd, we'd have a senior citizen probably. Yeah. <laughs> so, so welcome back, Keith. Um, So, like, like Brian had said, we kind of really just wanted to talk, you know, some little bit of pros and cons of, of jobs in the state of our industry. And, you know, like it's no secret. I've gone through some, some job changes recently and, and gosh, another thing kind of aging all of us. Like, I wonder if I added it all up, how many jobs I've had since this podcast, right? The podcast has maybe been the one constant in the, what, what is it? Eight years now, Brian? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there, there always and, used to, there was always a thing like, I, and I remember hearing this years and years ago and I never thought it would be true, but like, you know, your parents would, they would stay in the same town and they would typically work at the same place for, for decades on end because there was, you know, career paths built into to companies and, and companies didn't move. And then I remember, I don't know if I was in high school or college or something, and they said, you know, you're not just going to have like 10 or 12 jobs. Like you may have 10 or 12 different careers and stuff. And at the time I thought it was crazy, but you know, it's having been in the industry for a little while, having had some opportunities, it's not, it's not all that crazy anymore. People, people change jobs, but they also change very distinct roles. Yeah. I had maybe about 12, 13 years ago, I took this course on uh, workforce and there was uh, this text uh, workforce 2020. And I said, I'm, I'm going to keep this to see if it aligns. And I can't, I keep going through my old textbooks and I can't fi- find it. So I might, I might purchase it, but it, it is a, uh, you know, I'm I'm starting to look at jobs as not just, you know, there's the Netflix model where you come in at Netflix and you do kind of a project, you deliver the project. And then if you don't find something else, you move on to the next thing. And that is I'm finding that to be extremely true. Uh, yeah, makes perfect sense. I could completely see that. And it, you know, probably reflects some of our careers. So, so Brian, you had already kind of listed out some topics here. And, and I think probably the first one we kind of wanted to talk about a little bit was the, the, the trend of remote working. And is it possible? Like it's been an ongoing thing with, you know, and it's no secret that one of the reasons we started this podcast was because, you know, it's, it's two guys in North Carolina and we're trying to align ourselves to cloud and trying to figure out what's going on in the Valley. And, and, you know, it, it's, it's nice to be connected with Silicon Valley, but at the same time, neither Brian and I are ever going to live there. Right. And I get the feeling you're not either. Right. And, and, and so like, through most of the 2000s and even I'd say well into the 2010s, I felt like it was a really good time to be a remote worker. Like, you know, full disclosure, I haven't worked at an office in, I don't know, 15 years yeah. probably at this wow. point. Um, and, and, but it, it feels to me like the trend is reversing. It feels to me like the career growth probably isn't there like it used to be the opportunities maybe aren't there and you know there's this idea of of you know building teams and where do you build them and how do you build them and i have lots of thoughts on that but i'll kind of just flip it over to y'all and just kind of say that high level statement do y'all see that as well and do you do you kind of agree with it 
Yeah, I guess I'll jump in here. I, I've I've given this a lot of thought because I've been on and off. Obviously, you know, I, I ran the CTO advisor remotely for whatever, and I had subcontractors, and that's relatively easy. But I think the kind of the lesson from that, from a leadership perspective, is a organiz, organizational thing. Even within big organizations, like you can go, you can work for a vendor. And if you lead like an SE organization, you have no choice but to have a distributed workforce because that's the nature of the job. And but yeah, you look at a, a different function like, you know, HR or something else, that culture of remote work just doesn't I don't know if it doesn't work versus uh it's really hard to change the nature of that job. If you know of that leadership role, if you know what I mean. Yeah. I, I think there's a lot of pieces to it. I, I, you know, like when, when all the remote work was happening in, you know, like the early two thousands, a lot of that was because of outsourcing, right? I mean, it, we, we built this technology VPNs and other stuff to, to allow outsourcing. Um, and then, and then people were like, well, Hey, why can't I work from home as opposed to us worrying about like, offshoring some software development to India or, or something like that. Um, but I, I think there's a couple of things that have changed. I think part of it is just this thing we've talking about where um, people don't necessarily stay at companies as long or the project only lasts for a certain period of time. And so, you know, maybe, maybe there is a, a trend that is, well, if we're only going to be together for a certain amount of time, um, you know, I want to spend more of that time face to face with people and so forth um, to to, to me, sort of the, the contrast to that, though, is like, OK, I, I can kind of understand that. And I, I get if you're doing things that have to be more collaborative, maybe it's software development or something. The, the flip side of that, though, is, that you, you know, when you when you make it the the places where people can work is so restricted, it's just the valley or it's just Seattle or maybe it's just Boston or New York. Like, number one, your cost of living places are, are enormous. So it, it makes it tough for people to work in those places. And and just the traffic of getting in and out, you lose a lot of productivity time, you know, getting yourself up, getting dressed, driving into the office, fighting traffic, being in a bad mood, going home. Like there's a there's a strange sort of yin and yang that's going on there between better collaboration and just the burden of having to get into the office all the time. Yeah, I just saw that conversation on Twitter. Uh, there, There's this this challenge that's inherent to saying I'm going to hire. There's this diversity challenge that comes into saying I'm going to hire in a specific city uh, just because, you know, if you go to the Valley, it's uh, I, I'll share a, a somewhat personal story. Me and my wife were uh, at the. Uh, uh, one of the upscale stores in the Valley. And one of the, the associates came to us and said, are you guys shopping here? And we said, yeah, we are. And he said, Oh, please move here because there's not enough people that look like you here. And that, I think that's one of the inherent challenges. So as we talk through kind of career changes, as you know, you, as you desire to, to work for one of these Valley based companies, a serious problem. We even dealt with this here in Chicago, uh, as we were looking to recruit for uh, folks, they just didn't want to move to Chicago and you end up with the talent pool of Chicago. So from a diversity of thought, a diversity of race, a diversity of gender, you create this kind of bubble uh, and you exaggerate it. I think when you have this idea that you have to work in a office. Yeah. Yep. And it, I'll add another wrinkle um, to all of this as well. I'll, uh, I'll, I won't give names of companies to kind of protect folks here. Um, but, but there is definitely some leadership challenges too. If you want to step into a leadership role versus being an individual contributor, some leadership roles, you know, like say product marketing or product management or some of these others where there is a lot of hallway conversations or it is, you know, what is considered a corporate based role as opposed to like you were saying, like SE leadership, you know, where it's a field field team that adds another dynamic to it that, that makes it quite frankly, borderline impossible and certainly severely handicaps you if you try to tackle something like that, or if you're trying to lead a team that is, um, you know, if you're a remote leader trying to lead anything but an all remote team, if you're trying to lead a hybrid team, if you're trying to lead a team that is, you know, everyone's at HQ and you're not like it, 
it is something that is, you know, some people have tried. Um, and at this point, I don't think anyone has really done successfully. And I think that's why you're seeing a lot like the public cloud providers and IBM and Google and a lot of these others really pushing back now and trying to bring pretty much all but field sales almost back to the core. Yeah, you know, one of my uh, opportunities when I uh, had to when I was coming into VMware, you know, I worked for v- VMware for a few months. One of my opportunities was either a uh, leadership role in marketing or uh, the SA role that I eventually took here in Chicago. And the hiring manager, the VP that was hiring for the marketing role, said, "Keith, we really want you, so we may make an exception and let you work from Chicago." And uh, frankly, you know, talking to folks that, uh, in the industry, uh, I'll let you guys do the math. I, at that time, I'm like, you know, I know a couple of folks that's tried that. And no, that's, I, I, that's just the, the nature of the role just doesn't lend itself for me to lead uh, and not have not be part of those hallway conversations. I either be spending, you know, three weeks out in Palo Alto or uh, just missing out on the depth of conversation that I needed to have. Yeah, I, I think it's something like if, you know, if somebody was saying, hey, give me some give me some career advice. You guys have done this thing for a little while. I I, I think, you know, maybe maybe back in the day, um, you know, there were there were companies were were more flexible about saying, hey, let's say you start in some individual contributor role that you're out away from headquarters. Um, I, I think there was more opportunities for you to to grow into management roles or, or leadership roles that were, you know, continue to be remote and you figured out how to deal with that. I, I think the guidance I would give to folks is if you think that's where you want to go, you want to get into management and leadership and, and that's where that is. It's more in headquarters. Like the, the earlier you can get there, especially if the, the you know, the cost of living or, you know, you're going to, you're going to disrupt your family, you know, um, like do that earlier than later. It, it gets much more difficult to say, we're going to uproot our family and move to the Valley or Seattle or wherever, you know, if you've got a house, you've got a couple of kids, maybe, maybe the grandparents are close by and they help with childcare or any of those types of things. Um, you know, do those, do those much earlier if that's your goal or your career path than, than later. Cause it just makes it really hard to, to upend that much. Um, and, you know, and especially if the, the price point or the cost of living is much more expensive. Yeah. Agreed. So I'm going to, I'm going to flip the topic and say from remote, let, let's talk about emerging tech because this podcast is about emerging tech a lot of times. And then we talk to a lot of folks and we've had a lot of startup folks on the show and, and, you know, we've worked for startups in, in the past. And so what is kind of some guidance or advice that, that we would want to talk about around emerging tech and, and some of the trade-offs, you know, like I, um, I'll, I'll share a quick personal story and then flip it over to everyone else. So I was actually uh, talking to somebody um, this week, actually, and it was kind of one of those. It's like, hey, you need some career advice. And so we hopped on the phone and it was a little bit of like, hey, my one option is, again, remote person, but pre-stealth, you know, startup or, or pre-announcement still in stealth startup at, versus a, let's just say, a you know, more secure industry job and for one of the bigger infrastructure vendors. And and they, it was a little bit of like, hey, what am I not thinking about? And it is a, a, a little bit of like, okay, what is the time does it take to put in the, in, into a startup? If it's a really small startup, it is a little bit of being in the office. It is, um, you know, how much you're going to work. It is the, you know, one in 1,000 chance that it's ever going to, you know, actually make your options worth, worth anything. Like there, I feel like there's a big trade-off probably even more so than in the past asked of if you want to go do emerging tech, there's a lot of decisions you have to weigh these days, um, certainly more so. And I don't know if maybe it's just because I've, you know, done a couple and I know more now, or I simply um, have just, you know, the space is getting a little bit harder to survive in. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think we're geeks and we, you know, most people like listening to this podcast because, you know, you can talk about, you know, you guys were way ahead of the serverless uh, trend. And I think that is the inherent risk to emerging tech is market fit. I it is so critical. Like the tech can be the greatest thing in the world, but if the market fit isn't there, 
uh, you're in for a world of pain in many different ways. If whether it's a company, you know, stringing along for 10 years and, you know, they have maybe they're close to break even or bleeding money really slowly, but the market fit never happens or it takes too long to happen, or the worst case scenario has happened to uh, me once. And it's funny because it was mainframe technology or migrating from mainframe technology. You would think, oh, yeah, most companies would love to modernize their uh, mainframe app. Makes perfect sense. It's a SaaS solution. The market just never materialized. So I think that by far is connecting the business opportunity to the emerging tech itself. That, that is probably one of the biggest challenges for me. Yeah. I, I, I mean, Aaron and I have had this conversation a million times and it's, you know, partially because we're remote and partially because we, we have this fascination with, with, uh, with emerging tech. And um, I, I think there's, there's two angles. I always look at it from one is uh, on, on the job side of things, like you have to be pretty realistic with yourself about like, what am I, what am I willing to trade off? Because between, say how much you travel, what your salary or stability of your salary is going to be, how much you, you know, you get exposed to sort of new stuff and love the new stuff. Like somewhere in there, you're, you're not going to get the best of all those things, right? Uh, startup, you're probably going to be traveling a ton. You're going to be working an insane amount of hours. You know, you're, you're, you're probably going to get paid less because it's, it's, you know, it's deferred off to stock and stuff like that. But, you know, but there is a, there is a huge rush with being like, I'm working on new stuff and, and, you know, everybody seems to like it. And, um, you know, the other thing I think people got to be pretty realistic about is, um, you know, especially if you're selling stuff that, that, or, you know, you're working on stuff that is involved with the enterprise there, there's kind of three paths. So there's, there's the path that you're hot and you're probably going to get acquired. Um, and so you have to realize like, I'm probably not really going to work for a startup for a long time. I'm going to end up at a bigger company. Um, you know, the second path is like, you completely burn out and fail. The company fails so that, and that happens a bunch, which is fine. And the third path is like, there are there is a small number that you know will remain quote unquote a startup for seven eight nine years before some you know money activity happens an IPO or getting acquired or what I mean that was that was kind of like the virtue stream path they'd been around for a long long time and uh, you know solid fire had been around for a while and so I think people have to be realistic about what the big trade offs are and I, and I think we find sometimes that the people are like no that won't happen they're gonna you know like that's where they they end up kind of getting burned sometimes. Yeah. Well, and then, go ahead, Keith. Go ahead. I was just about to say, don't forget, you know, emerging tech. I think we all have done emerging tech inside of a large company. Yeah. You know, there's it's not just startup and the, doing emerging tech inside of a large company is a completely different set of challenges. Oh, yeah. You're it, you, you're you're a startup, but with the shackles of uh, and bureaucracy of a, a of a super big company and a politics. Yeah. So so I um, I had a, another point, but let me let me expand on that, too. Something else to consider, because I've been part of, um, you know, two acquisitions into larger companies. The biggest thing to consider in something like that, like emerging tech has its own set of risks. Acquisition has its own set of risks. And the biggest risk in an acquisition is is just the the antibodies kicking in and like, you know, it's a little bit like organ donors, right? The, the organ getting rejected, right? Like that is the biggest thing you have to deal with in the acquisition. You, you get absorbed in this larger thing. And, and most of the people see that as risk. They see that as the, you know, something they've built a comfort level over the years and they don't want necessarily you coming in. Like, you know, Brian and I have a running joke when it, whenever there's a, you know, these big acquisitions announced like, Oh, we bought you for the culture and we bought you for this <laughs> and we bought you for that. Like, and it's like, well, it's almost like bingo, right? We can go down the checklist and go, yep, yep, they said that. Yep, they said that. Like, it's the same playbook over and over. But the, at the end of the day, the larger group that's been making the money, the cash cow, doesn't necessarily want a new kid on the block a lot of times. Um, so that was that one. The other thing I was going to say, too, going back to this, the startup thing is, you know, I don't even know if you remember this, Brian, but it was one of the startups I was interviewing with way back when, when I was just doing this. And Brian was like, believe 50% of what they tell you. Hmm. And, and so no matter how in love you are, like, just, just assume 50% of everything they tell you is a lie. And then assume even less of that will come, you know, come true in emerging tech. And it's not because they're trying to deceive you. It's because like you, your product market fit won't be there. The product won't come together. Somebody else will come along and displace you or have, you know, more funding. And, you know, it comes down to at the end of the day, think of it this way. Like the way I've been telling people that want to join startups now is, you have to believe that 
there's probably only going to be one company in a space that's going to be IPO. Let's take some recent examples like HCI companies, Nutanix went IPO and all the rest of them got bought. You know, all flash arrays, pure IPO'd and all the rest of them got bought. Like it, it's something that happens over and over and over. And so you have to think about like, are you going to be, or is this company going to be the one company that is going to make it. And you have to feel that strongly and still back out 50% <laughs> of what you believe. And that's how strongly you have to believe in, in startups a lot of times. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I think people forget sometimes because, you know, there, there's such a buzz that happens when there's a new startup or somebody gets a big round of funding or whatever it is. And it's like, y- y- you have to remember like the odds of of David beating Goliath in technology is is really hard. I mean, it's like the, the incumbent in any given space has so many things going for them. I mean, they they have, you know, bigger sales force, they have cash in the bank, they have customers that, you know, have operations and skills that are built around doing stuff the old way. So it's you're you're not just convincing somebody that the new tech is cool and new and and whatever it is, but it's like you have to be willing to grind through all that personal inertia, you know, corporate inertia, you know, all sorts of stuff. Um, and so for the ones that do actually break through and make it, and I mean, like, that's a pretty amazing journey. And I, and I, you know, like all of that grinding, all of those long days and stuff never gets written about in the, you know, in the news, nobody talks about it at meetups and stuff, but I mean, like that's, it's a, it's a small number. It's a small number and it it, it really is hard to beat the big incumbent, um, just, it's just the numbers. It has nothing to do with, is your tech cool or your founder smart? It's, it's just, you know, the systems are designed for incumbents to, to continue to do what they do. Um, and people to just keep, you know, not make changes. Yeah. That's the whole podcast. (laughs) (laughs) That's exactly it. That's exactly (laughs) it. So let me, let me throw something out at you. I I, kind of want to, I kind of want to gauge your guys, uh, bullshit meter a little bit. Um, you know, we, we all, have a tendency everywhere in the industry as, you know, as certain technologies uh, get older, um, you know, the, the number of people that say sell it or, or, or whatever, you know, gets smaller. We start to say, well, things get commoditized and, and value moves up the stack. And, and that sounds cool. Uh, We all know what stacks look like. What are you, how do you think about that in terms of your career, in terms of, you know, all of us have at one point been around infrastructure, you know, sort of the lower level parts of the stack. We, you know, we're involved somewhat with, with things a little higher up. But I mean, how do you think about that in terms of your career of going like, am I am I moving up the stack or am I moving towards value and stuff? Oh, Brian, you're touching a sensitive topic here. That, that's, third, third rail? Yeah. yeah, third rail. I this mean, it's going to be good. Go ahead. I mean, it, Go ahead. You, you, you first. If you step back, this is absolutely true. Like if you step back and look at the arc, you, you – you think high level. Yes. I need to stop. Uh, you know, if I, if I replace drives for a living, I probably need to in, inside of a large organization, like a customer side. If I, if my job is to replace uh, uh, drives, rack and stack, I probably need to move higher up the stack and add value. I'm, I'm you know, giving an extreme example, but I was at the, the VTUG uh, a, a month ago and I gave this talk on what's the reality of the ground as I'm, you know, in my role talking to a large range of customers. I had this uh, large architectural conversation and we we're talking about the value of, of the futuristic workspace, et cetera, enabling that. And one of the enterprise architects for a really big company came up to me and said, you know what, Keith, my primary application is a mainframe green screen and I'm just not seeing what you're seeing. And for him and that very successful company and industry, and I don't think they'll get I don't think they'll get disrupted anytime soon. He's absolutely right. There was no need for him if he planned on, you know, being there for the next 10, 15 years and retiring, probably moving up the stack probably is not very worthwhile to him. But then, you know, you hear about, I think, publicly, uh, what's the the Chick-fil-A uh, announced that they're deploying Kubernetes, 6,000 like containers across 2,000 physical host in their environment you're like what the hell man it's what what's what's real and what's not real yeah <laughs> i love that well so i'm actually going to approach it slightly differently and and i've said this on the podcast before there is a difference between 
greenfield and you know brand new installations and those are sexy and fun and they do tend to generate a lot of interest in the industry and we ride all these waves i mean just since we've been doing this podcast right it was openstack versus cloudstack and then it was docker then it was kubernetes right like there's all these this is the hot waves that everyone's riding but at the same time, I actually approach it completely differently now. Whenever I'm thinking about what's next, you know, there is a lot of money in in the brownfield. There is a lot of money in what's not sexy. And there is a lot of money in just displacing very traditional old stodgy problems. And I've been more, you know, when I think about career transitions, I think more in the case of like, okay, how big is this total addressable market for the, this, you know, company or this, you know, I've worked for a partner in the past as well, you know, for these partners, what is the, what is the total area surface area, if you will, that we can go monetize. And I'm more worried about the business aspects of that more so than I am the sexiness of the technology. And then I try and combine that with what can I take away from this job? You know, if I, if I go do this job for three to four years, or I come out the backside of it, am I, what am I going to learn? Am I going to learn some kind of soft skills? Am I going to learn some kind of, you know, harder skills? It, it, you know, I mean, let's be really honest at the beginning of this podcast, I was very proficient in cloud stack. Uh, you know, that's not very valuable anymore in our industry. Um, so for me, it is very much this, this trying to provide a value, but a value against a big market more so than I am trying to move up stack. Yeah. Have you guys, you know, if somebody sort of said, Hey, you know, give me an example of that. Obviously we can point to, to companies that do successful, you know, selling, more software and application centric stuff or, you know, things that are, but like, can you think of good examples, you know, just of people that, you know, that have been like, yeah, I started as this and I, and they moved several layers up the stack. I mean, do we see infrastructure people that are, that are writing code that's, you know, not just like automation code, but further up the stack? I mean, is that something that, that should be realistic for people or, or maybe the question is like, you know, what's a realistic time frame if you if you want to make a transition from a skill? Is it is it two years? Is it five years? Does it depend on you know what other things you have going on in your life? Oh wow, good example of someone who's made the transition. I had a buddy that uh, definitely started out in an infrastructure space, and then on the side he started to write code for. Uh, he got involved in writing code for a friend that was making a uh, algorithmic based trading system. And to this day, he kind of plays in both. Both are, uh, are paying gigs, but on the whole, I think the only tangible example that I can think, well, there's two, there's a uh, Kelsey Hightower who obviously is, you know, a traditional infrastructure guy. Uh, but he, he speaks developer extremely well these days. I don't know if he does, you know, I don't, I can't say he does pure development for a living. And then there is the other exact example uh, uh, on Twitter, Murden. I can't think of his name, uh, his, his uh, full name. He's going to kill me, but uh, <laughs> he, you know, he was traditional. He was actually app developer. He was in development, moved to networking, kind of moved back and moved. So there's that transition where I've seen people come and he's the second person I've seen do this they were high up the stack application developer and they transitioned to specifically networking for some reason i guess because it's a distributed problem and they've uh they they've made the transition the other way oh that's a that's a great point i was actually trying to think about this earlier too and i i wouldn't say you know it's impossible but i would say the odds are against you know we 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 talk a lot about you know infrastructure folks becoming app folks or or app dev folks over the years but i actually think it's a slightly different and more subtle trend and i think it's infrastructure p- folks become different infrastructure folks and what i mean by that is us that have been you know on prem building data centers kind of stuff it's moving to cloud infrastructure kind of stuff, right? And so it is more of the systems architecture and putting those jigsaw puzzle pieces together and understanding that and taking that that underlying skill set and transitioning it into, hey, what is that, what does that look like in Amazon services or what does that look like in Azure services, et cetera? Right. I think 
I'm seeing that more so. Um, and I certainly am seeing, you know, specialized, you know, solutions overlay teams start to form of like, okay, this is the AWS expert. This is the Azure ex- expert, you know, things like that, that, you know, want to have those kind of conversations and, because it's just the nature of it, then they start to dabble in automation. They start to dabble in development. They start to dabble in APIs and scripting. But I haven't seen anybody make a transition into, hey, I'm a developer now. It's more of a hybrid in between the two, if that makes sense. And just before Brian jumps in, one you know critical factor here is you know salary, and at what point you're making this transition. I think we've all been in this transition that you know we we are all hands on engineers at some point, and we made the transition to whether it's marketing, uh, product uh, uh, development, lead, etc. We've made this transition. And salary becomes a, comp- uh, I think uh, the uh, the Amazon CEO used this word, so I can use it, complexifier. Uh, salary becomes a complexifier for when you want to do something different because your skill uh, in that new area isn't strong enough to demand potentially the sal- salary that you command today. So you're limited into what roles if you can't take the salary cut to, you know, start over a little bit, that that is definitely uh, a, a consideration when you're considering uh, moving over or moving, quote unquote, up the stack. Sometimes you move up the stack, but uh, to a lower career level. Yeah, I, I think there's a couple of analogies there that, that work in this. I think in Aaron's case, what he's talking about is, you know, you can you can be relevant in, in sort of your domain but but in the new the new model, right? So like you said, you you know you were you were a VMware centric person, so it was more on prem, and you know workloads moved to Amazon, so you you're sort of the infrastructure person around Amazon, and those those skills are are pretty transferable. There's some learning, but it doesn't. I, I think in Keith Keith, I think your your analogy is a lot of times, um, you know, the, the closer you get to where the money is, um, you know, a lot of times people move from. Uh, more time on keyboards to more time talking about it, but they also move closer to the people that that influence decisions, and um, you know, and that's and that's sometimes a logical path, and that path may put you in marketing, it may make you an evangelist, it may make you a product manager, um, but you know, you've got enough experience to be capable of of speaking to people about uh, you know what they're doing as opposed to just you know being the technologist that's kind of uh, you know enabling it and so forth. I, I want to finish up on one last thing because we're gonna we're, we're running a little bit long. Um, you know, do you guys see anything sort of trend wise that that may take some like here? Here's the one the 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 analogy I use all the time is that there there really no longer are just like projects at a business. Like every project is essentially an IT project uh, because there's always some technology part of it. It's you know we want to go to market faster, therefore we need this app and this app, or we want to collect this data and we want to do analysis on it. Um, do you see any, any sort of trends happening? Maybe it's, you know, sort of these low code development environments where it's less about code and more thinking and reasoning. I mean, do you see any, anything going on that, that tells you like, Hey, um, you know, people that have technology backgrounds will be more, could be more business relevant, uh, but they're going to have to go learn this thing. And Keith, I know you, you spend a lot of time in this space doing some consulting and, and talking to CTOs. Do you, do you see anything on the horizon that might make sense in that shift from more technology centric to more business centric? Yeah, the I have this long term theory. You know, you guys have a lot of AI experts on. You have uh, 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 kind of, you, you know, you can peer into the future and kind of see where the future is going. And the future is going is that business users are have to become a little bit more tech savvy, but at the same time, the technology is going to move closer. Uh, to the business user being able to consume I'm one paragraph into this blog post I've been writing for the past month on uh, the future of the uh, digital workspace for a typical enterprise user. And that's going to include AI. So this, you know, the buying center for what we call infrastructure today over the arc is going to move towards the business user. You, we see it now today that uh, businesses outside uh, business units outside of IT are controlling more of what we consider IT budget than before. And I think that trend is going to cons- continue as uh, as VMware, Red Hat, even Rubrik, as as these companies figure out how to package software products 
or solutions that uh, are easy, as easy to use as use as Excel, the conversation is going to shift towards that towards that uh, towards that focus, and we need to learn how to speak that conversation and that value to that user. Whether you're internal IT, external IT, doesn't matter. Uh, the conversation is shifting more towards business. I like that. Yeah, and the only thing I was going to add to it was the almost, you know, really, really simple criteria you can kind of say is like, okay, does this make sense for the business is you can apply the simple statement, uh, you know, does this remove friction? If the answer is yes, it's good for the business, right? (laughs) Like sometimes it's, it's as simple as that. Um, and you know, moving up the stack is nothing more than, than finding friction and removing friction and continuing to move up. Um, and, and I completely agree with Keith. Um, you know, what we're looking at going forward in the next five to 10 years is, you know, we always see these technology, ex, you know, curves accelerating or waves accelerating, and we're just going to continue to see that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think, I think, uh, I think you guys are right. I think, uh, you know, the, the, the more we can be focused on the business, the better. And I think that's a good starting point or a good point for us to, to sort of jump off. So guys, I, I appreciate, uh, I appreciate all the candor. I appreciate the conversation and I appreciate everybody bringing their, uh, uh, um, large number of years of maturity and experience to this as, uh, as we'll, as we'll wrap this up. So, <laughs> but, uh, guys, it's been good. Keith, um, for folks that, uh, you know, are, are digging all the things that you're saying, where can they go find uh, kind of the newest stuff you're working on for CTO Advisor? The easiest way is go to thectoadvisor.com. That's spelled the proper way with an O. And uh, you'll see all of a, uh, there's a link to subscribe to the podcast and uh, to the uh, video content that I uh, sometimes publish, publish on YouTube. Very good. Very good. Well, listen, man, thank you for being on. It's always great to have you back. We'll have to do this more frequently. And uh, for Keith and for Aaron, everybody, thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Thanks for rating the show on iTunes. And we will talk to you next week. Thank you for listening to The Cloudcast. Please visit thecloudcast.net to find more shows, show notes, videos, and everything social media. 